Hello, I'm David Bott from the Institute of Positive Education here at Geelong Grammar School in Australia. Thank you for joining us for episode two of our new series, Teaching Remotely, Learning Together. In this episode, I interview Steve and Victoria McClucky from the Australian International School in Sharjah, United Arab Emirates. Steve is the Executive Principal and Victoria is the Director of Learning and Wellbeing. In this episode, Steve and Victoria share their stories from the first six weeks of teaching remotely over in the UAE. Steve and Victoria generously share lessons that they've learned, what's worked well, some of the challenges they've faced and some of the resources and approaches they've been using. I hope you find the interview enjoyable and useful. Victoria and Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for inviting us along, David. Good Thank to you. see you, David. Thanks, Steve. Hey, it's, uh, it, it's great to see you guys. And obviously, we've known each other for a little while now, um, given our, our team's work that we've been doing in the Middle East and so forth. Um, but very few people watching this will know much about AIS, the Australian International School in Sharjah. So maybe Steve, can you just tell us a little bit about it? It's a it's an amazing school, a kind of a exceptional world class school in many ways, but very strange being an Australian school in the Middle East. Just give us a tiny bit of context about AIS in Sharjah. Yeah, no worries, David. Well, we're a privately owned co-educational school from ELC to grade twelve. We're licensed with the Queensland government. So in the, in the formative years of uh, to year 10, we follow the Australian curriculum and we're the only school in the UAE that follows the Australian curriculum. In senior school, we have two pathways, which is the IB pathway and the Queensland Certificate of Education. And so we're very much a holistic school. We um, really cater for the needs of all children. Um, we've been around for 15 years and we're looking to open up a new school in July. Supposed to have been this September, but I don't think that's going to happen quite now. So, uh, yeah, bad time. Uh, yeah. a lot. But, uh, we also have 1,600 students as well and uh, a nursery attached to our school. Great. And and your role, Victoria, as Director of Learning and Wellbeing is a pretty broad role and um, AIS has a, such a, an emphasis on wellbeing. Can you just tell us a little bit about your role and where you really place yourself and the, the real emphasis that you have in the school? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, my journey to wellbeing started um, at, at Geelong Grammar actually many, many years ago when I came and did some courses there and, and really learned about what does wellbeing look like in schools and what are the advantages of having an intentional focus on wellbeing. So my role, David, really is um, from ELC to Year 12, strategically looking at well, how do we put wellbeing at the forefront of everything that we do as a school community with our students, with our teachers, with our families. Um, I'm very blessed that I've got a principal who's extremely supportive of wellbeing and, and the difference that it can make in education. So that sort of sums up my role, positive education, moral education in the UAE, of course, is a big thing here. Um, but really looking at how do we make it the most positive institution um, that we can do. Mm. Oh, thanks, Victoria. Um, so let me let me start with this question here about uh, change, because obviously we're seeing profound change in schools all around the world um, at the moment. What are the most exciting developments that you're seeing in your school right now? Perhaps if you wouldn't mind answering first, Steve, about you know these big impacts that are happening as a result of the the pandemic and remote learning. You know, just the most exciting developments. I think if you ever want to be part of a revolution in schools, this was the time to be a part of it. Um, some, some of the, you know, the, the really significant things that have changed is we've gone from a face-to-face -face service delivery model and within, I'd say, 10 days has become a totally online service delivery model. And, and we're not just talking about teaching and learning. We're, we're talking about a whole school, you know, finance, um, courses, um, virtual tours of our school because we're towards the end of our school year and uh, we're focusing on next year as well. So we all have to stop and go, well, how do we now become an online service delivery for everybody, uh, the wider school community? And, and that was probably the biggest thing that we had to do in such a short period of time. And so for us, it was going, well, how are we going to do this and how are we going to do it differently? But making sure, and I think the most critical thing here is about how do we look after the well-being of staff, students and families through this, not only 
um, with what's quite the world's facing, but also personally for every child getting through this um, and their families um, and our staff, of course. So that has been the most significant thing we've had to do in such a short period of time. And we've been online learning now for, we've been out of school for eight weeks and we've been online learning for six. Yeah. So you, you guys are still a few weeks ahead of uh, certainly Victoria um, and have obviously learned a lot of lessons. Victor Victoria, along, along the along the way of, you know, over the last six or eight weeks where you've been doing remote learning, um, your role obviously has been very significant around nurturing the well-being of the, the community. And, and we've just heard from Steve, the executive principal, who's just said, you know, to, to paraphrase Steve, you said that the most important focus for us uh, during this situation has been the well-being of our community. Um, perhaps, Victoria, can you tell us two or three big lessons that you've learned about the student experience and student well-being during this time? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that it's, it's certainly highlighted that connection is everything um, among students. And look, for the first four weeks, it was a novelty for our students. Yeah. They really enjoyed being at home. They, they, you know, learning in their own bedrooms. But now all we hear from students is, I want to be back at school. I miss the teachers. I miss my friends. So it, it's certainly reinforced connection and relationship absolutely means everything. The other thing, the, the main feedback that we have got from students over the six weeks is around the amount of work. And that's been a trial and error because of course this is new for everybody. So the most the significant impact on student wellbeing has there's been too much work. So each week listening to our students, tailoring it back. Um, and that it's quality over quantity. Uh, you know, the conversation globally has always been around um, we have a cluttered curriculum in Australia, whether it's America or England, and it's been a great time to really pull back, declutter the curriculum and allow students time to really consolidate. So that has had the most profound impact on wellbeing is tailoring it to kids but listening to them and giving them a voice throughout this whole process. Let me um. I love. Can I can I just pick up on that word you sh you used then, Victoria? And that was declutter. Can you just tell us one or two examples? Or how have you? I love that approach about really stripping back to what really matters. What have you done that's worked to help declutter the curriculum? Um. Oh, look. There gosh, so many things across secondary. It has been reducing lesson time. So making lesson time smaller has been a big thing. Um. And for for us. We're not doing any assessment in the primary school at all this term. Uh, no summative assessment. So, you know, quite often teachers feel that pressure of, I've got to teach, assess, teach, assess. So without that pressure of assessment, it's about going back to our data sets. What do we know about our children? Steve will always talk about the who, the what, and the how. Who are our learners and what do they need? And really now tailoring our curriculum to go back and address the gaps that we know are forever present in children's learning and not feeling pressured that we have to go on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Um, Steve mm -hmm. can probably add to that as well in terms of what's happening in the school. Yeah, look, um, as, as Victoria said, the main thing for us is when we talk about the who, what and how, the what is always there. Content, content, content. Mm. You can deliver that in multiple ways. It's always there. But what we have to really think about is the children. Who are we teaching here? Um, we've been really um, mindful of what differentiation really looks like. When a child's at home ready to learn, where they enter in at, we've got to be, we've got to make sure that they can enter into the learning. Remember, they've only got a parent at home or maybe themselves. So when we, we set work or set tasks or things to do, we've got to make sure that children can actually do it themselves and be part mm -hmm. of that. Not just, here's the learning, you must do it. And I know with our own children being at home and we are full-time um, workers and full-time parents at the moment at home, we've had to help our children through that as well as become self-learners and self-regulators of their learning. And mm -hmm. we're very fortunate because we have differentiated whole of our learning to make sure that either can enter in at different levels where they feel comfortable. But let me, can you, let me, t let me dig into that a tiny, let me, let me dig into that a tiny bit, Steve. I just love the concept of differentiation online. You know, I, I taught in the classroom for 15 years and I appreciate how difficult differentiation can be even when you've got 20 or 25 kids in front of you and you're trying to adapt 
to each child. Just tell me a little bit about how you've approached that, the strategies you've used to differentiate the online remote curriculum. Yeah, so, but we, 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 oh, sorry, Victoria, you're up. No, sorry, I was just going to talk about that we have four and we have optional. So uh, across the whole school, we only have maths and English and in our context, Arabic as the core curriculum that students have to do. All other KAs are optional. So there are pre-recorded lessons um, and live lessons for PE, for art, uh, for music, but we understand that it is absolutely critical that we are flexible in our approach. Every family is unique and we have to make sure that a parent who's working, who wants to do the work at four o'clock in the afternoon with their child can do it. We've got students who will do every lesson and who are actually now modelling and teaching their lessons online that we post on social media. But we've got other students like our own and we're perfectly honest, we, we're full-time working. We will only get through the English each day, but that's who our needs family. So um, flexibility is absolutely critical uh, and also we feel really anxious about attending live lessons. So we work alongside those students, they're all pre-recorded so that they don't have to be on camera with their class engaging and they're flourishing, they absolutely love it. They're doing really well with it. Um, but yes, Steve, sorry. Yeah. I was just going to say, we, we work in pods as well. So the main thing is, is when we break down the curriculum or we're teaching a concept, we might have one teacher who, who pre-records that concept, but then um, students can then get online with their own classroom teacher and explore that concept at their level of what that may be. In the work that they have to do then, it can be broken down and in a, a better term, it may be mainstream, maybe work for extension and work for those who are not at the mainstream level struggling a little bit with it. And we have a really good traffic light system where children can then press the traffic light of whether they're green and they get in that concept. Amber, I don't know too much or red, I'm really struggling with that. And and what our, our support, our enrichment team can do then is work with that traffic light system and go, where are the students who are red who don't get it? We get online with those students and put them through in smaller groups, so two or three or maybe one on one. So consolidation of a concept to be revolutionized what we've done not just move on you didn't get it we're moving on yeah mm -hmm. i love that sorry to be super nerdy steve i just i just need to understand this a little bit more i love this traffic light system so just tell us about the practicalities of how does that work is it some part of your technology or is it just a, a question how, how do you actually allow students to, to give you a green red or amber light so we use google classrooms um, okay. after every activity that a student can do and we have seesaw as well for the years after every activity they can do um, online. And there's another bit of information is that students can either do it on their computer or their parents can um, print it off and then they can do it by the old fashioned way we call it and then take a photo and upload it. Part of the, the traffic light system is after every activity, the traffic light comes up, a student then will, will tick which where they are on that traffic light, that will be their teacher. So a teacher gets immediate feedback on where the children are at in terms of their learning. The honesty is, I don't get this concept. And that's okay, but what we do then, in the live session, the teacher then will work with those students at their different levels to understand that concept. Or we have a really fantastic learning enrichment team who will then um, contact that student and say, I see you are read with that concept. How about I work with you online for the next 10, 15 minutes to go through it? It, it is part of this online system is that everyone in our school is working. It's not just the classroom teacher. What we've done is all support services are working to ensure that the learning is happening. And I'd say that's what personalised learning is. Uh, we use that term a lot, personalised learning, but it's about knowing where our learner is, how then we can help and support them. And that's what wellbeing is all about. I get a concept. I feel good about myself, um, which is what we really need to have. And that's how we've made, managed to do that. Uh I love that approach. And I, I think I've had a lot of discussions with uh, educational leaders over the last few weeks and there's it seems to be this debate about synchronous versus asynchronous learning and should you deliver lessons live or not. It seems to me that what you've done is kind of blended, taken 
the best of both worlds, you know, blended that concept together so that the students can dip in and out of the the live opportunities, but also have the asy the asynchronous offline kind of opportunities to access content when they need it at their level. Um, so th that's a really um, exciting way. I think you've been able to differentiate interest, but also level of uh, ability. So no, really, really impressed by that. C can I ask, um, Victoria? Um, you know, you've spoken about some of the things that have been going well. Obviously, though, your role, I imagine, uh, is a very human role as well as a structural sy uh, systematic role. Your role is about humans largely. And so tell us a little bit about what the, the from the teacher's perspective, from the educator's perspective, from the people who are on the front line, what are you learning about uh, the, this experience for teachers, particularly around their well-being and, and, and particularly, again, uh, any strategies that you're using that are working well? Yeah, I mean, it's tough. You, you, I, mean, I think it just shows how adaptive teachers are, but it's been very challenging. Change is, change is challenging at the best of times. And it's really what we have done is got people working in teams. I think we're quite lucky where we are, David, as the same as Geelong Brown, where we have on campus. So, but we also have a lot of staff who are living off campus. So, um, the first thing uh, is that um, as the executive principal, I know that she directly contacts all of those staff living off campus and does a weekly check-in with them to see how they're going to make sure that they feel connected to the school as possible. Um, and, and that's been really successful. And people really value that being acknowledged and they just appreciate that phone call. Um, myself and uh, guidance counsellor. Um, we hold weekly, weekly check-ins that people can have. Um, we check in with teachers constantly. Um, but we have challenges as well. We've got videos that we've made. So just trying to keep things as light as possible. So we're doing a tissue box challenge this week where I think we've got to catch a tissue box and then throw it to the left. We make a video of that. Um, we're doing a bloopers tape. So of course, when teachers are recording themselves, just a little bit like this now, where you sort of think, oh my goodness, you're not used to being on camera. So teachers have made lots of bloopers, so they're sending all their bloopers in. So all of that kind of stuff just lightens it, lightens things up a little bit. It keeps people connected. Um, but of course, you know, people are concerned about family, they're, they're away from their family. And it's just, it, it's about connecting with them as much as you can. Um, you know, we're all humans and that's what we need. But yeah, we're just, we're just trying to have a little bit of fun with it as well and enjoy it. And we've got, um, we do shout outs for teachers. So I, myself and the student council run the student drop in. So, um, grades four to six, seven to nine, ten to twelve. Each week we run an hour session and students just drop in and tell us what's been happening in their week. They give us their feedback about, um, what's going well and what's not going well. But they also do teacher shout outs. And so, you know, like, like anyone, they the teacher get that feedback to say, oh, so, 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 you're amazing. I love your lessons. You've been super creative. Um, it, it reinvigorates them. So, it's giving teachers positive feedback is critical. How are you doing that from the kids to the teachers when there's no face to face? Great. And are those those drop in uh, sessions, Victoria? They're just a kind of a Zoom room that that any student can just come in, pop into it. And when you obviously there's been some nice uh, successes that have come of that. Can you also maybe tell us a little bit about the success in terms of the buy into that? Has it been a, a, a majority of students have been attending those sessions, or a small number, or how, how successful have they been in terms of uptake or buy in from the students? Oh, look, not, not many students, I would say, because I think that in our senior school, they have that everyday live contact with all of their teachers, plus our deputy principals up in secondary, they do an assembly, they do a pre-recorded assembly that the kids get to watch. Um, so not so much in senior, but of course our 10s to 12s are coming towards the end of their journey, in particular our 12s, they're doing IB, they're, they've got a bigger workload. Um, but in our primaries, yes, we have the same students. This week, for example, uh, we had one whole grade five class who came in and they said, look, we would just like to um, present to you that we'd love to all stay together going into next year because we've only had six months together. And so Steve is in there as well and literally every student in that class presented why they think they should stay together as a group next year. So it's just that, you know, 
they're not, it's just that they can say what they want, they bring mm-hmm. their friends in. Um, some kids just do it just to connect with other people. Um, yeah, but we, yeah. we really enjoy it. But they give us yeah. really, really great feedback. Um, yeah. They're our clients. And yes, yeah. No, I love, I love, I love that approach. approach. Everything you've said, Victoria, has been very uh, human-based. Like it feels that you're – desperately trying to do everything you can to connect at a deep level. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned that the blooper reel, that was also mentioned by Matt Cal- uh, Matt Seddon in the interview last week from, from Callet School where Matt talked about these fun opportunities to just engage in a really fun, lighthearted way. And I, I wanted to ask you, Steve, about that a tiny bit. You know, that you, you're the executive principal and that's a pretty serious role in a pretty serious school, um, yet you're kind of endorsing these blooper reels and this kind of fun. How, how do you get the balance right between, or how are you personally getting the balance right between playing your really, you know, important senior role as a senior leader in an organisation, but also embracing the fun human side of things? Um, he's yeah. talking about his humour day, just so you know. <laughs> I, I hadn't picked up on that. It's funny. Oh, Victoria, I noticed uh, yeah. that. Um, actually, I was just going to mention that too. Yeah, it is human. I think, um, you know, in the seriousness of what the world's facing and everything, you, you know, the other thing is you look to the positives of what's going on as well. The chance that the world is recovering in a lot of spaces. Um, like in Italy, they're seeing the water for the first time and fish mm-hmm. swimming in the water a metre deep, mm-hmm. you know. We look yeah. to the positive thing, being together as families. Um, you know, we will we'll remember this time in, in 20 years when we look back and, and I'll cherish the time that I was with my wife and with my children. We always talk about, um, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could spend more time together? Well, you can now. Uh, and I think that's been great. Playing Monopoly, playing things, I think for me it's been that balance. And then I look to um, our teachers and Victoria mentioned before about we differentiate for the, the students but also for our teachers, our teachers' strengths and where they are. Some teachers are really good online, some teachers aren't very good online, but how are we making sure that we get the right support to the right people? And, and we talk about uh, equality and equity. You know, yeah. we need to be equal. Well, no, we don't. We need to be equitable. We need to make sure that everyone's getting what they need. And so for me as the principal, I think um, it is bringing the human element and making sure that, that the human touch is there. When we talk about emails, there's group emails and then there's individual emails um, and, and people need to know that. And the recognition of staff and what they're doing every week, we recognise the staff and what they're doing. Um, and I get into the lessons and not, not with a, you know, there's a, an annual performance review and mark and tick what they're doing, but get in there to support them and then just say, wow, that was a fantastic opportunity. What you've done there is great. I think people still crave the feedback, but the positive feedback. We're giving out certificates to staff, certificates to children where they work online. Then we're getting to take a photo and then upload it. And we have uh, our, our, our Twitter Tuesday where we, we're sending out to the world what our children and so what our teachers are doing. I think with the bloopers, that's that's the funny one. Um, my honesty is this. Victoria said, Steve, you have to send out a video. We'll call it video um, to, to all, all the all the the wider community. And I'm going, I just don't want to go. It's just not me. And then mm. and uh, it took me about probably about an hour and a half for, for three minutes and um, the bloopers and then Victoria decided to send the bloopers to all my executive team and it was just and yeah it was funny and even I laugh at, about it but I think we watch teachers teach and they're teaching you know in a different format and they've made mistakes and we're watching going um, they've just put the decimal place in the room <laughs> and they go oh the decimal place and, and what we've said to them no don't don't redo the take do it as real because children need to know that we're all human when we make yeah, mistakes yeah, and uh, yeah. and that's okay. And, and we can have a bit of a, a joke yeah. and a laugh about it, but we move on as well. And, and you've got to keep that human element. There's the yeah. business, but there's also the human side to it and yeah. keep that. You've got to keep that balance. Yeah. No, I, lo- I love that approach. Thanks, Steve. W- while we're um, while we're on the the concept of bloopers, um, you know, this is my little segue, my little interview segue here um, on the uh, – Obviously, you guys are doing some amazing things and we've talked a little bit about some of the successes and some of the strategies that have worked well. But let me push you on this one question, Steve, if we could if we could go back to November 2019, you know, six six months ago before all this happened. um, What would what piece of advice would you give yourself that might have helped make things even better? Or is is there something you wish you'd known back then that might have helped you make a more informed decision? Um, you know, so what's something you wish you'd known back then? 
Um, to be honest, I would have loved to have been more tech savvy. Um, I didn't know. I didn't know Zoom, Google. I think as a principal, I didn't know Google Classroom, Zoom, or anything. I'm going. Well, have we explored this side of the of learning? No, because we're face to face. I think it would have been great if we had have explored those sides of things. But also having um, in your structure in your school, having people who are researching these things for you and then bringing them to you. I think we just had to make things up on the spot. Um, and so having people who are now, we've got we've got people offline now who are researching best practice around the world and then being able to provide, provide uh, professional development for that. I think that was probably the other thing. We're really good and I think over the last 10 years of going, well, here's a new platform. Here's This is what another school is doing, but we don't PD staff on it. We just say, here's this, go and do it. And everyone goes, well, I haven't got time to do it or where have we planned for that? And I think one of the focus for us is going to be having people who are supporting teaching and learning by making sure we've got um, uh, human resources that support teachers and, and show them what to do, not just here's a video clip on how to do it. We've got to make sure that we're upskilling our teachers all the time in the new ways. But also the other thing is being flexible um, and being creative and let them let them do things that would probably hold them back. Let them be able to explore and do those things. I think that's really important. And on a personal note, if I could give myself some uh, advice back in November, it was not to book any travel. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah get in travel. Plenty of money being held in Qantas's little uh, account at the moment, aren't they? Isn't it from, from us? But um, so I'm fascinated by this concept, Steve, you've just mentioned. Maybe, maybe Victoria, I'd love to get your response on this. And that is that. Um, our institute um, is is an you know in a, a disruptive kind of part of a disruptive movement that's really helping to place wellbeing science at the heart of education. Um, what we've seen in education over the last 10, 20 years that I've been involved in education, but also in the tech world and business world, is that largely innovation occurs around the edges. So you'll have a little two or three educators that are tinkering with some new technology or a new approach or it's flip learning. It's kind of happening around the edges on the periphery, almost almost by stealth. You know, we kind of have these innovations that gradually creep us forward in, in education. But what we've seen as a result of the, of the pandemic is innovation occurring right at the center, at the heart of what schools are doing. What I'm, the question I'd love to ask you, Victoria, um, how much of this innovation and change and development do you think is permanent? Like when when the pandemic gets uh, uh, released, um, when we're at the back end, when we're all able to revert back or come back to our face-to-face -face schooling, how much of the change or innovation that's been created will stay and how much of it will just kind of revert back to how it was, do you think? Well, uh, look, we, we were speaking about this on our morning walk this morning actually because uh, we were saying how wonderful it's been to have these student drop-in sessions. And so I said to Steve, oh, look, when we go back to school face-to-face, -face, I might continue those student drop-in sessions. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've got to come at lunchtime, kids won't come at lunchtime. You automatically default back to that original way of thinking. We're like, well, we don't. We can do it after school. We can do it at 7 o'clock at night. We can continue doing those student drop-in sessions via Zoom. Um, so it's about challenging our way of thinking we are mm. so stuck in that industrial way of thinking in education. so it's really pulling out what has worked well parent teacher interviews i mean our parents fly around the world they're busy they're working um they you know they have five or six children so why can't we do parent teacher interviews via zoom um coming into next year so i think so much of it we will look at the way that we have always worked in mm. schools and look at, well, is that the most effective, productive way? And it kind of hasn't been. Yeah. So I think a lot of it will stick, definitely. What about um, summative? Let me ask you about summative assessment then, Victoria. You mentioned that earlier and that's gone at the moment for many of your students. Does that come back or is that that hey, stay look, gone? Dave, Dave, I'm the Director of Wellbeing. I say can summative assessment, but I might get in trouble by the time. <laughs> <laughs> might have to check with the boss. Um, Steve, uh, I'm mindful that we're um, getting close to our time here, um, but love to, if you wouldn't mind just uh, speaking about this innovation uh, that you've made around hotlines and parents being able to directly access the resources they need and people they need in the school. Just tell us a little bit about the hotlines that you've set up. Yeah, look, I think one of the most important things is the day we, we were saying that this is going live, this is going to be our first day of online learning, 
we knew that parents and students and everyone was going, everything was going to fall apart in terms of I can't get my lesson, my I can't get my password, uh, my computer's not working. This there was going to be that. What's what we set up was a hotline service, and we had about ten people with a phone, and we had them under year levels, and then we had IT support, general support. But the major thing was it was having someone on the other end. We had no pre-recorded messages for parents. If you're in trouble, do this. Or, no, you got to speak to someone. So we eliminated the frustration straight away and we had that connection with parents and with students. Your, your password's not working. Okay, I can fix your password right now for you. So it was instant, instant um, addressing of concerns and issues. We did that for a week. Um, and at the moment, we've got our hotline still going, but um, no, like Victoria's got a hotline. She's had no phone calls in the last two weeks because... We did it early. We hit it hard early. We had heaps of people available to, to look after those. And so my advice to people is parents need someone to talk to, whether it be about well-being, whether it be about IT, whether it be about curriculum, whether it be about anything. But who do I go to and can I speak to someone? Not get an automatic uh, response, but have that connection to someone to do it. And that's what we do. We all know how frustrated we get when we bring up insurance companies and press this, press this, and all of a sudden you don't get what you want. And you're, yeah. oh, or you email and you, you don't get an answer and you need an answer straight away. So it was really that parents could have answers and support mm. straight away. Mm. No, thanks, Steve. Victoria, the last question to you um, that I wanted to ask is, do you have any further um practical strategies or tips or resources or books or websites or anything else that you've kind of discovered in the last six or eight weeks that might be helpful for others to have a look at? Oh, look, I mean, I, I, a huge thank you to Geelong Grammar because um, we, we purchased the PIC curriculum, which is, of course, from Geelong Grammar. We purchased that when it first came out. So our students each week do a moral slash moral positive education classes. So, um, we have sent out all of the remote learning resources from Geelong Grammar, which have been amazing because it's, it shows that we're still learning as this kids can still do mindfulness. They're still doing brain breaks. Um, parents are actually engaging in it and can, and can see what we're doing or would be doing in a normal lesson, which has been wonderful. Um, we have the e-resources e from Visible Wellbeing from Professor Lee Wilkins which our teachers have used and we're sending out to our parents as well. Um, we're sending out uh, weekly or, sorry, daily wellbeing tips. Um, gosh, I could talk forever about resources and things like that. We're, we are a stymie school, so that's another wonderful resource that we have always had in our school, but simply um, for those people that don't know it, it's an online reporting platform for students. So. They can anonymously report harm. They can anonymously report if they've got concerns with teachers or friends, particularly at this time if they, if they haven't heard from a friend that they would normally hear from. They can do a STARMY notification for us and, and we can then check in with that student. So, um, look, You Are Strong is another one that we have um, where parents at the moment can get free access to the parent resources, which is all around friendship. So, I mean, we've been, I think the world feels very grateful to all of these online companies and institutes who are doing everything for free. There's so much out there at the moment for parents and schools to access. It's just about researching and finding what works well for you. Um, Thanks, Victoria. Well, I think, um, that, uh, no, thank, really appreciate that. And we'll, we'll put those links in the, in the comments section below uh, this video on the YouTube. Uh, link and so people maybe can access that and there may well hope you don't mind I imagine there might be one or two people that might contact you guys as well but I'm sure you, you wouldn't mind sharing some of those ideas as well um Steve we, we we're coming uh, right to the end here but just I, I, I couldn't let you go without mentioning this concept of um which I, I loved when I found out this that um your theme for this year your school's theme has been connection before content and that was a theme you created last middle of last 2019 um in a kind of uh, a crystal ball moment maybe where you're able to see the future, but that concept of connection before content is what we're hearing schools around the world really emphasise that at the moment that matters so much. You know, if the phrase Maslow before Bloom is another way that, you know, what we're hearing a lot, that used a lot as well. Your school was doing that anyway. Um, it's obviously very pertinent at the moment and not only is it relevant, but love the fact that your school is 
everything you've spoken about in the last half an hour or so is focused around that concept of connection first and content second, making sure the humans are right. And so, so I'm very, very grateful that you've um, been able to share that, all of that, being willing to have a conversation with us to help other schools as well. So thank you so much for your time, Steve, for your time, Victoria. And, and hopefully the footy comes back on for you, Steve, soon. We're not far away, I think. Oh, no, we're all waiting for it. Don't worry about that. Um, and again, thank you, David. And, and you thanks to John Grammer for the work that they've done over the last 10, 15 years. as the adaptation of what you're doing in your context, in your school. But, but if I can leave with this, that if you don't have happiness, if you don't have full well-being, it doesn't matter what content, doesn't matter what curriculum you do, English, whatever, you will have nothing and you won't have success but you have happy and healthy staff, happy and healthy children, happy and healthy families, you have everything. And that's what this journey has, has taught us in the last 10 years. Thanks so much, Steve. You guys go and get back to your beautiful family. Stay well and we'll, we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Thanks so much, Dave. Cheers, guys. Thank you. Take care. Take care.